In this lecture video, we're going to be looking at the article, Why Abortion is Immoral, by Don Marcus. He says that the problem of the ethics of abortion is the problem of determining the fetal property that settles this moral controversy. The thesis of this essay is that the problem of the ethics of abortion, so understood, is solvable. So what he's going to do is he wants to look at what is it exactly that makes killing immoral. And he thinks if he can offer um, a good theory, one that is able to then account for um, why as well abortion is immoral based on just killing in general being immoral, then that's going to settle this moral controversy. So we'll look first at theories of why murder is wrong, and then we'll see, based on his theory, how that also is able to explain why abortion is morally wrong. Okay, so he thinks that it's uncontroversial that murder, in general, is wrong. But we want to know why. What is it about murder? What's the property of killing that makes murder wrong? Is it because killing brutalizes the one who kills? Might it be that when one kills, this is the display of a vice? So it's the case that a person is not being virtuous, and they're wronging themselves in that way by acting out of vice. Perhaps it would be that the great loss of others who would experience uh, uh, um, who, who are losing the experience of us due to us being killed is what makes murder generally wrong. Then it might be we could say, well, if I'm killed, I can't you know, make any more lecture videos, so this is going to deprive people of the experience of learning about the things I talk about in lecture videos. Um, or just, we could say, someone getting killed, um, you know, that might just make people sad, and so uh, that's m what might be wrong about murder. Maybe it's the sanctity of human life. Maybe there's something about human life that is valuable in itself, that when a human being is killed, it's just simply immoral. So Marcus thinks that these first two um, potential responses, they don't focus enough on the actual victim. But the third one, while it does focus on the victim, doesn't do so in the right way. So Marcus's theory is that what makes killing immoral is its effect on the victim, and specifically, the eradication of that being's future like ours. He says, the loss of one's life deprives one of all the experiences, all the activities, the projects, and enjoyments that would otherwise have constituted one's future. Therefore, killing someone is wrong primarily because the killing inflicts one of the greatest possible losses on the victim. So when you kill a being that has uh, a future like ours, you're depriving them of all those things, all those experiences, activities, projects, enjoyments that we generally value in thinking about a future like ours. So let's look at his theory, and he thinks to test it, a theory that explains the moral wrongness of killing will do so by explaining only both things. First, that the explanation fits with our intuitions about the matter. So it has to be something that makes sense to us on a kind of basic level. And two, there's no other natural property that provides the basis for a better explanation of the wrongness of killing. So we want a theory that is intuitive, so it just generally makes sense, but also it's theoretically more coherent than any other alternative. Okay, so again, Marcus's theory is that killing is immoral because it eradicates that being's future like ours. Firstly, Marcus thinks that this theory explains why we regard killing as the worst of crimes, and so it fits the attitude of dying. That we regard it just to be a wrong for killing someone typically because of the loss of that person. We don't typically think about it as um, it's wrong by focusing solely on the murderer, although we might have a, a fixation on justice in the case of uh, wanting to punish maybe the murderer. Um, we are just sad um, when someone is killed because of how it might affect others. We are sad when it affects others only because it might 
take away some of the future they might experience. But primarily, he thinks, we look at dying um, as something we don't want to typically experience because we will lose out on uh, a future like ours. We will lose out on those potential activities and so on. So he thinks his theory makes intuitive sense. But what about its theoretical um, uh, consistency? What about uh, its, whether it's coherent or not? So, secondly, he thinks the claim that the loss of one's future is the wrong-making feature of one's being killed entails the possibility that the futures of some actual non-human mammals on our own planet, or potentially even others, uh, aliens or so, are sufficiently like ours that, such that it is seriously wrong to kill them also. So he thinks his theory explains not merely why it's wrong to kill a human being, but why it can be wrong to kill monkeys dogs, um, cats, etc. So his, his theory is incompatible with the view that it is wrong to kill only beings who are biologically human. So one, he thinks we, we have this kind of intuitive sense that it's wrong not just to kill human beings, but other animals as well. Maybe we can't really explain why we also find it wrong to kill other, other beings. And his theory says, well, it's wrong to kill other beings because they have a similar future like ours. Now, it might be different. So Marcus says we can think of this as matters of degree on a spectrum, so that a human being has the closest enough to a future like ours. It's the kind of bar. But a monkey has also a kind of similar future like ours. Um, so maybe we can think about, well, it might be um, – wrong to kill a human being, less wrong to kill a monkey, but more wrong to kill a monkey than, let's say, a cat, but more wrong to kill a cat than, let's say, an ant, because, you know, we can look at which one has uh, more of a similar future like ours, and we can explain then why we, we see different degrees of moral wrongness in killing depending on the kind of future like ours that's being eradicated, or the similarity of the future like ours that's being eradicated. Now, three... The theory does not entail that euthanasia is wrong. So sanctity of human life theories, those which say killing is wrong because it is a, 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 it's a violation of the inherent value of human life, they can't argue that euthanasia, uh, even in the most severe cases, extreme cases, is wrong. But Marcus thinks his theory can explain why it's not wrong for someone to take their own life when, say, they are suffering from a terminal illness that, um, let's say, is going to take a long time to kill them, so there's going to be a lot of uh, suffering, and so they're not really going to have what future they have left isn't really going to be a general future like ours. And number four, this account, his theory, entails that it is prima facie, so it's on its face, seriously wrong to kill children and infants. Why? Why would it be wrong, seriously wrong, to kill children and infants? Well, because the uh, amount of a uh, similarity to a future like ours, the kind of degree and the, the length of a future like ours that they have to experience is greater than, say, an adult. So that's why typically he thinks intuitively we find it worse to kill a children than an adult, but also we can explain just in general why it would be wrong to kill children. Now, theories that talk about uh, killing based on personhood such that um, potentially, if anything, just has personal identity, it's wrong. Those theories of personhood cannot straightforwardly account for the wrongness of killing infants and young children. So in all these cases, Marcus thinks his theory of why it's wrong to murder is better than any other theory. So how does this relate to abortion? So if we accept that his theory of murder is the best theory, then he thinks that the immorality of killing because of the loss of its future has consequences for the ethics of abortion. Because killing a fetus denies it the kind of future life that is typical to human persons, and so it's wrong to kill the fetus as it is to kill any other human person. 
So they don't need to be an infant or a baby or a child to say that, well, they're being deprived of a future like ours because a fetus, if carried to term, would then continue to have a future like ours to experience. So he says, the future of a standard fetus includes a set of experiences, projects, activities, and such which are identical with the features of young children. Since the reason that is sufficient to explain why it is wrong to kill human beings after the time of birth is a reason that also applies to fetuses, it follows that abortion is prima facie seriously morally wrong. Now, two clarifications. So, first, his argument does not say that since it is wrong to kill persons, it is wrong to kill potential persons also. So, it does not say that a fetus is a person, that it is a human being, and that's why it's wrong to uh, have an abortion, right? So the category he's working with is not personhood, but instead a valuable future like ours. His argument does not rely on saying a, a fetus is a person. And secondly, just as the theory says that sometimes killing an adult human is justifiable, so does it say the same for abortion. Right? In this case, uh, with euthanasia, it says that, well, uh, sometimes like f uh, uh, physician-assisted suicide might be morally justifiable because, uh, let's say someone has a terminal illness, and so they're going to suffer for a long period of time before they die. Well, his theory would say they don't really have a future like ours anymore. It's not one that would be desirable. In that case, it's not valuable. So it's not a future like ours hours. Similarly, some fetuses have uh, issues, let's say, like a bone degeneration where their bones break down or other things which can actually cause suffering for the fetus. And if that's the case, um, you know, maybe it's only going to live for, you know, a few moments. Um, e even in that case, sometimes it's not the case. But sometimes, let's say you carry it to term, it, you deliver it, it's only going to live for uh, a few moments. It's not a valuable future like ours. And in that case, it would be justifiable as well um, to, to uh, have an abortion. Because again, it wouldn't be a desirable future like ours. Okay, so let's consider two objections. So the first objection says that a necessary condition of one's future being valuable is that one values it. A value implies a valuable, a valuer. Right? So we judge, when we value something, we judge it. And we say whether basically it's desirable, it's likable, um, or not. Therefore, the objection says, since fetuses cannot value their futures, their futures are not valuable to them. And so it's not clear, well, if a fetus can't value its own future, why then would it be wrong to abort it? Because it's not something it values. So Marcus responds by saying that, um, his theory does not entail that, for example, my life is of no less value unless it is valued by me. So he rejects the claim that a necessary condition of one's future um, depends on one valuing it. He says, I may think in a period of despair that my future is of no worth whatsoever, but I may be wrong because others rightly see value, even potentially great value in it. Furthermore, my future can be valuable to me even if I do not value it. This is the case when a young person attempts suicide but is rescued and goes on to significant human achievements. Such young people's futures are ultimately valuable to them even though such futures do not see val seem valuable to them at the moment of attempted suicide. The second objection Contraception prevents the actualization of a possible future of value. Hence, it is immoral. So this objection seems to be strong on its face because it's saying, well, uh, if you use contraception, you're preventing the possibility of a being that can have a future like ours. The way that um, Marcus responds to this is by saying that the obligation to maximize future values does not exist. So his theory does not say we have a moral duty to try and maximize as many beings as possible that can have a future like ours. 
all his theory says is that if there is a being that does have a future like ours, that we recognize it to have a valuable future like ours, then it's immoral to kill it. Therefore, according to his theory, contraception is not immoral. Now, if some new science were to come out and it were to say, well, actually, there already are, uh, let's say, human beings uh, that contraception terminates, this would change uh, the scenario. This would say that, well, then there is a being that actually already exists that does have a potential future like ours. In that case, it would be immoral to uh, use contraception. But as all the science currently says right now, Marcus says that contraception is not immoral according to his theory. Now, to further uh, consider this and analyze why exactly the use of contraception isn't immoral for his theory, he considers four candidates of a possible subject of harm, and he thinks all of them aren't then subjects of harm. All of them are not denied a future like ours. Now, the first one would be just some sperm or something like it. Well, just some sperm by itself doesn't entail that it will have a future like ours. It requires um, uh, more than just the sperm by itself. And the same thing with the second candidate, some ovum or other. Ovum by itself does not entail a possible future like ours. So in both just sperm by itself or ovum by itself does not constitute uh, it is having a future like ours, and so it's not wrong if we um, get rid of it. It's not a case of killing. Now the third candidate, a sperm and ovum separately. So this is not together but separate. Again, we might say, well, think about all the potential sperm and ovum in the world. Um, we're denying, again, potential futures like ours. But even then, you know, we've already seen Marcus say that uh, we have no duty to maximize the number of beings that can uh, have a future like ours. But furthermore, he thinks it's just not feasible at all to talk about uh, having some moral obligation not to kill sperm and ovum separately because it wouldn't even be clear how many sperm and ovum there are and how you would bring all of them together to create um, or to, to preserve um, beings that have a possible future like ours. It just doesn't make any sense. Now the fourth candidate, what about sperm and ovum together? So for Marcus, sperm and ovum together is still not enough to say that it has a possible future like ours. It's only when it has become a fetus. If contraception works uh, at the point where there's still in sperm and ovum together but not yet uh, what can be determined to, to be a fetus, then it's still not a case of killing because until it is a fetus, it lacks a future like ours. And so in this case, Marcus says that it wouldn't be a case of killing. So again, contraception is not immoral according to his theory. I think there's two important questions or worries to consider in his theory, both from actually opposite sides of, of the argument about abortion. The first question or worry is whether Marcus's argument puts the sole moral focus on the fetus and therefore neglects the potential suffering of the mother. We might think of cases like, um, you know, maybe the mother is going to die unless the fetus is aborted. What would his theory say? We've already seen his theory say that it explains why we, we, we see it as perhaps extra wrong to kill children as, as opposed to merely adults. Well, if we consider the same, well, a fetus has a greater... Um, amount of a future of ours like ours to experience compared to a mother who's going to be older. So would that mean that if we can, we give birth to the 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 fetus, the the child, even though um, it would kill the mother? Is that satisfactory? But what if, even if it's not the case that the mother's going to die? But what about in instances of rape? Wouldn't it? His argument seem to say that well. If you are raped and, and you become pregnant, it still wouldn't be justifiable in aborting the fetus because, you know, um, it, it's not that the child, you giving birth to it, would have a terrible future like ours. You could give it up for adoption or something like that. So it seems to neglect the, the experience of the mother, potentially, in these cases. Now, on the other side, I think there's a potential worry uh, from the pro-life uh, side. We might ask, does Marcus's argument allow actually too easily for abortion in cases of fetuses with disabilities? Potentially, his argument might seem to say that, well, if you have a fetus, 
um, that has some kind of a severe disability, cognitive disability or something like that. It might not be, you know, a desirable life. It might not therefore have a future like ours. And so in those cases, it, his theory might say it's justifiable to have an abortion. Now, generally, his theory says it's not morally justifiable. But in these extreme cases, perhaps his theory does say that. So these are some questions to consider, I think, um, for his argument as to why abortion is immoral.